So we'll call the Government Operations Committee meeting to order for December the 13th. And at this time, I'd like to welcome our two delegations uh, this afternoon. And once again, our apologies for keeping you waiting. Uh, our first delegation today is uh, we have Frank Marino, Linda Sachenko, and Wynn Mott from the Lower Columbia Community Health Center to present to us on the BC Association of Community Health Centers. So welcome all of you and good to see you. And who's going to carry the ball first? Hi, Sandy. That's that's going to be me. Thanks, Frank, Frank and, and welcome again. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for having us here. So the reason why we want to present to uh, Council is that uh, we've formed a, a working group called the Lower Columbia Community Health Center Network Group. And what we're trying to do is form a community health center network in the Lower Columbia. And that would be Fruit Trail, Trail, and Rosin. And the reason why we're here, because there was a sense that uh, physician recruitment is at a crisis level. It's hard to recruit new physicians to family practice. Uh, many people in our area are without family physicians. They're unattached, as they call it. And we think that the, C, the community health center model is more attractive to younger physicians as they come out of school to practice in a, in a community like that. And the reason why is that a community health center is run by a nonprofit organization. It's not owned by the physicians. And that makes it easier for the physicians to come in. They don't have to hassle with having their own business and own clinic to run. So we have formed a working group uh, under the auspices of the Health and Hospital Committee of the LCCDTS. Um, the working group is myself, uh, Wynne Mott, Linda Sachenko, Lori Verrigan, who's a nurse practitioner, Dr. Janet Fisher in trail, Carolyn Amatea from Seaball, some of you might know her, uh, Jen Schmidt, who's a consultant, but used to be a, a medical office assistant at the, at the Columbia Clinic, and Dr. Mike Scully. Mazel. We also have doctors Libby Nelson, Jonah Sandstrom, and Sarah Tucker who are interested in what's going on, but they're not able to make the meetings, so they're not really on the working group. Frank, if I could just, just so I get an understanding moving forward. Uh, so in uh, real basic terms, this is more like a, a cooperative then with shared services amongst nurse practitioners and, uh, and general doctors. Exactly. So, so what it is, you, the organization would, would invite the staff in, physicians, nurse practitioners, social workers, occupational therapists, counselors, etc. Right? Okay. The, whole, the whole idea is that it's a team-based approach and that the community has certain groups on a committee in, inside the organization that would suggest some of the uh, services that should be provided in the area that may, may be a gap. And one that stands out, as you all know, is uh, mental health and addiction services in the area. Like what other services could be provided in this, in this local area to complement what we already have? Okay. That's just one example. Okay, thank you. I just wanted an understanding of- Yeah, no, that's- in my head. And please feel free to ask me questions anytime as we go through. Thanks, Frank. Uh, in September of this year, we conducted a needs assessment working with the Kootenai Boundary Division of Family Practice. So that group helped us with the research into what are the needs in this local area. And the result, and we sent you the report. There's a one pager about the Lower Columbia CHC, but basically that report came out and said the time to act is now because you're gonna have more of a problem in recruiting professionals if you don't do something. And we think that something should be a community health center. And what we're looking at, the, the way with the discussions we've had since September and on, it's looking like it's more of a network where we have a clinic in Fruitvale, hopefully one in Juanita, one in Trail, and one in Rosin working together 
as one group where we can share social workers, we can share dietitians, we can share occupational therapists and doctors maybe as we go along. So that's the whole idea we're working on now. Um, you mentioned the BCACHC, the BC Association of Community Health Centers. They're an organization that has 17 members, 17 CHCs all across the province in their organization. And we now are a member of that association as an emerging CHC because we don't actually have one yet, but they're willing to help us uh, advocate and guide us in terms of how to get there. So they're, they're a good partner to have because they have the ear of the Ministry of Health in uh, Victoria. So they, they uh, said to us, they'll help us get through this. Anyways, um, some of the, pre the presentations we've made so far, uh, we made a presentation of the Rotary Club, that was the first one. We went to the East End Services Committee of the Regional District, and they gave us a letter of support on this idea, but then they also told us, you should make presentations to the municipalities, and that's why we're here today. Um, so we're making presentations to all the local municipalities in the East End area. Uh, we're also looking at what other organizations we should be making presentations to. We haven't come up with that final list yet. We have bent the ear of Chris Katrine Conroy already. She knows what sort of what we're up to. And she knows we'll probably go to her for some support when we're ready to say we need to move forward because obviously we'll have to have the Ministry of Health uh, understanding what we're doing and support us. We also need the help of Interior Health because they are the ones that have and uh, employ the allied health people. Those are the social workers and nurse practitioners, occupational therapists. They're aware of what we're doing through what's called the primary care network, which I'm not gonna go into a great deal, but Interior Health and the KB divisions of family practice are on this committee that talk about primary care in the area. So we've made a presentation to them about what we're trying to do. We're also lucky enough, we have some soccer college students from the rural medicine studies who are going to conduct two research projects. One is about uh, mental health services in the lower Columbia and what could be done uh, to improve that through a community health center. And the other one is another group of students who are looking at physician recruitment into CHCs. Is it in fact more desirable for young physicians to work for a CHC versus working in a private clinic as a family practitioner? So those are the couple of things that are gonna help us with some of the questions we need to answer. So at this point, the reason why we came to the municipality here, the trail, is ask you, what we're asking for you is a letter of support about the concept of forming a community health center in the lower Columbia area. That's our ask at this time. And I welcome any questions. Carol? Hi, um, Frank, a couple of years ago, and uh, Mayor Pays, and you may remember this too, I went to a presentation in the Muriel Griffith Room at Selkirk College, and this was put on by some local physicians, and they discussed uh, almost this same structure. Is Are we running parallel? Is that still ongoing, or has that died and you've picked up from that, or can you add well, to that? I don't think it's a parallel thing. That may have been the, the coup. Kootenai Boundary Divisions of Family Practice, talking about the uh, primary care network, which they have instituted in their own private clinics okay. with, with uh, IH employees going into their clinics and providing services. Okay. So that's done. This is a, well, this is uh, I was a at that different. meeting too. Uh, and uh, it, this is really uh, down the road uh, from that, but it's, it's really on the same track. Uh, uh, there were people who were interested, who, who were concerned about the future in trail yeah. uh, and uh, were interested in uh, getting something going that would, uh, uh, you know, that would, would help solve our problems. So this is really, uh, if you like, the, the child of, of that meeting. Uh, it just took a while uh, to get it uh, going. 
So my second question, Frank, would be when you spoke about all the, the support services under mental health, would you be looking to bring in psychologists or psychotherapists? Well, that could be something we do. Uh, okay. We're at the stage that we're just exploring what could be. We are talking to different groups, including the, the local physicians. We actually yeah. made it. We actually made a presentation to the KBRH Department of Family Practice, and they endorsed us and said they're going to give us a letter of support as well, because they see where they also see. I think where it could be advantageous to have this type of thing in our area. Okay, because I've in the last six or eight months, um, we think of mental health issues just to be with those people that are are struggling with homelessness and such. Um, I've been astounded to find that there's a lot of mental health issues with our young people that are in in Crow and some of the other high schools. And it kind of, I found it quite shocking. And so there is a real, real need out there. Absolutely. For for this kind of service. Okay. Thank you. My wife used to be on the board of Freedom Quest, which is a group that deals with uh, adolescent mental health and addictions. And it's shocking to hear some of those stories. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Santori? Yes. Can, uh, Frank, is there any connection here with the safe injection site? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I guess down the road there could be, depending on what happens with the, with the whole safe injection site thing, but that's more of a, I think, a provincial uh, initiative. Okay. Thank Lisa? you. Lisa? Um, Councillor Doby, you to answer your question, I just want to concur with uh, Mr. Marino and Mr. Mott that the discussion here today is a continuation of that grassroots work that was done at, um, I guess, a couple of years ago. I just want to note that at the hospital district board, there's been, you know, a fair amount of presentations on this and from the members asking for clarification and, um, you know, primary building primary care networks is a mandate of the provincial government. The trouble with them is that you're integrating, sometimes it's a space issue. Where do you put these big clinics? Does a municipality or can you co-locate services? Who's paying for it? Who's paying for the bricks and mortar? And how do you integrate physicians and um, employees who are paid by the government versus private practice? and fee for service versus salary. And that's where some of the rub is coming with it. Um, I think the province would probably like to have everyone under the, the salaried model, but those, the, those physicians that are doing fee for service aren't really anxious to give their autonomy up. So that's part of the rub in it. But that said, um, when this first came out, you know, the I think the KBPA and divisions of family practice realized that there needed to be a community group that stepped forward. So I'm glad that the LCC DTS is, is doing that. And it's a great function of their role through the health and hospital committee. And at the hospital district, I asked very point blank to uh, the presenters, is this a pri- enough of a priority that you would like us to continue as a group to advocate for primary care networks in our area to take some of the stress off provision of services, whether it's specialist care or GP care or RTs, whatever that looks like. And it was very much a yes. So I'm absolutely in support of um, of providing a letter for this initiative. Thank you, Mayor Pace. And I remember the issue of pay and uh, pay by fee or structured salary that was discussed at the uh, the previous presentation too a couple of years ago. But thank you, Mayor Payson, for doing that. I've got a question for you, Frank. I mean, I I totally support the concept. I guess Lisa touched on the question that I'm that I bring. I mean, with respect to like a need for first, I, I'm, I'm assuming a needs assessment is going to have to take place in terms of the services that are identified throughout the community of what are what the city and the and the region needs. Uh, now, for people like uh, professions like uh, nurse practitioners and doctors, in terms of those payments, it's straightforward. They survive on on their billings, but. It sounds like if we wanted more outreach workers or mental health and addiction services, et cetera, uh, those are usually funded by governments. So am I correct 
by assuming, okay, we can attract them here, but uh, I, I don't know, it's a chicken or <laughs> the horse in the wagon. Do we have to request and apply for funding through Interior Health? Is it, to, is it through um, the Ministry of Health? How do we fund those individual professions over and above nurse practitioners and, and doctors who are, sat, who, you know, they make their living on, on billings? Okay, so, uh, yeah, we would have to work with Interior Health to get those other professionals working inside the clinic. Now, some of them are already working in doctor's clinics. Like, we have, okay. they have social workers. And actually, the nurse practitioners are being paid by Interior Health as well right now. Oh, they're not on billings? No. Oh, okay. So, the doctors are. Now, some doctors, and we, we're looking at this thing. Is it... Do we have a model and there's different models of how to run the community health centers with physicians payments? Do you have the physicians still bill fee for service and you take a cut from their pay for the overhead because they're paying for overhead already anyways in their own clinics, right? right? Or do you get a salary physician? So we are discussing that with uh, the physicians who are working with us about how that might work. Obviously, we don't have an answer yet, but that discussion has to be had and it has okay. to be had with the ministry as well. Okay, thank you, Frank. Lisa? Yeah, I think we um, need to separate it out a little bit. So overdose prevention sites are the mandate of interior health. And I believe that they would be separate from this initiative. Uh, primary care clinics are GPs, social workers, physiotherapists, your staff that you need to support that, um, counselors, potentially some specialists, and the, the intent is to provide longitudinal care for those in the basic medical system and focusing potentially on those who have complex care needs as well. So if you have a heart condition, you don't have to go to six different spots to get care. You can get your diabetes care and your, your respiratory therapy care, et cetera, all in one co-located service. Different from um, providing outreach services, street outreach to the vulnerable population, which is more of an OPS. So. Um, the bucket, this bucket is, is different. And I believe the funding is different as well. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions, other questions from any council members? Sandy, I just had a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Colleen. Um, thank you, Frank, for this presentation. Uh, lots of information here and lots of good information too. Um, I am totally supporting this um, project. I hope it uh, works for our community and the area. I'm just wondering, and only because um, I'll be honest, I haven't had the opportunity to um, look up this question. So I'm wondering if this initiative um, has um, anywhere else in our province um, have one of these um, complex care. The community health center? Yeah. There are 17 running right now in BC. Oh, wow. Well, that should be good. Yeah, and there's an association, the BC Association CHCs, which we are now a member of. And uh, we will get support from them in terms of, you know, what's our next step? They, they've been through it all. They, knew who, they know who to talk to in Victoria, which is very important, obviously. So mm -hmm. we'll get their support. And we can also now call up the other CHCs and ask them, how, how did you deal with this issue? You know, that's yeah. it. Oh, good. Frank, are these community health centers, are they predominantly in the urban areas or are they throughout the province and rural areas as well? Uh, they're in rural areas as well. There's some okay. in, uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but they're in both rural okay. and urban. Awesome. Thank you. Oh. Any other questions of either Frank or Wynn? Um, Councillor Santori, do we have a motion on the table for that letter? If we don't, I'll be happy to make that motion. No, we, do, letter of support. we have a motion by Lisa Payson to support the request for a letter of support. Do we have a seconder? I'll second it. Second. Seconded by Colleen. Are there any other questions or concerns? No. If not, the motion, all those in favor? 
Aye. So the motion is carried. And on behalf of council, Frank, we do want to thank you and your group for initiating this. And we uh, extend to you the most success and the best of luck. I know it's a lot of work and I'm sure council uh, would be more than uh, happy to assist in any way that they can with this initiative moving forward. So thank you again, Frank and Wynn okay. and the rest of the group for taking this on for our community. Yes, and uh, we'll keep you updated in terms of what, what's happening. When do you Thank see you, this, Frank, when, sorry, when do you see this going out to some form of a public, I, I mean, it's public tonight because it's on a GOC, but do you see yourself doing some sort of a presentation, for instance, in the, if COVID permits, in the Trail Memorial Centre, just to give the community uh, a bit of information and pro, um, possibly how the community get involved in the process? Well, we will be completing our municipal presentations by the middle of January. Right. We have a visioning uh, date set with a few people on the January 18th, I believe it is. And then after that, we'll look at what our next steps are gonna be. So that'll be one thing we can put on the agenda. Awesome. Thanks very much, Frank. And if we don't see all of you, all the best and have a happy holiday season and new year. Thank you very much. Thank Bye you. All. Thanks, Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Okay, next. Let's see Samantha, Sarah Benson Lord, Jeff, and we're here for the and Joanne Beatstra. Sorry, Joanne. This is my, okay. my little headshots are small on my computer. I can't get around them fast enough. Anyways, welcome. And uh, Council's looking forward to your 2022 budget presentation, as well as some of the initiatives that we've seen and closed in our package. So on that note, Samantha, I'm assuming you're going to take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm here today to briefly talk about um, where the library will stand financially um, at the end of the year um, to demonstrate that we have been fiscally responsible and also present the 2022 budget proposal. So please feel free to stop me along the way if you have any questions. Um, we did have um, a few challenges um, this year with regards to um, the me, budget. Samantha, yeah. some, are you guys hearing humming in the background? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Can you try speaking again, Samantha? It might be coming from sure. the mic. Um, so the first, we had um, a few, we faced a few challenges um, in the library. Can, is that better? No. 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 So it's, it's definitely coming from your end, but we'll just have um, to listen more intently. What if I put my headphones on, maybe? Samantha, are your other speakers off on your regular computer? Sometimes. Yes feedback there let me double check i don't see any there you go. on no i didn't do it i didn't do it and if i is that oh it's worse no that's, that's worse, worse. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to come in here samantha is mine quiet yeah hey, you're yeah. fine why don't I, why don't you come in here and I'll sit at my table so we're distanced. Okay. <laughs> I've got your budget proposal open on my desktop so you can look at that. Okay. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. It's like we almost had the whole library board here today. Yeah. It's great to see everybody. <laughs> I have to say it was nice to see Wynn here, but that oh. other initiative did still seal him from the board and yes. we're very upset about that. <laughs> Thanks, Samantha. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so we did face a few challenges um, that did affect our budget this year. The first being uh, the purchasing of capital expenditures um, and supply chain issues. I think everyone's uh, fallen victim to that. Um, personnel issues, most of which have been resolved, um, as well as the replacement purchases of our 3D printers and the large television um, in the multipurpose room. 
So if you wouldn't mind turning to page two of my proposal, you'll see under projected uh, deferred revenue that um, the first line item there does refer back to the capital expenditures. So we did try and avoid this by putting in large purchase orders um, in June and July. Um, however, we're still faced with, um, we're still waiting for orders. So I am requesting that um, at the end of the year, any money for those purchase orders be um, carried over to 2022. Um, any retained money from personnel and benefits due to ongoing staffing issues. Um, Sorry, sir, that money hasn't been expended yet though, right? The ones that you wanna carry over? The purchase orders? Um, yeah, we usually pay for things when they arrive. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, there is some retained money. There'll be some retained money from uh, personnel um, and benefits from ongoing staffing issues. Um, requesting that a portion of that uh, be redirected to a multi-year fair fall um, contract. It's a one-time request and um, it'll save li the library money in the long run by um, renewing for a multi-year. I believe the contract um, number that I put in your package is the larger one, the five-year. Um, and userful is our, um, it's the software that we use for our public um, computer systems for those of you that don't know. Um, and then once the our, our budget is balanced this year, we are happy to return any um, retained money from the personnel budget back to the city of Trail. We do understand that, um, you know, with COVID, it has been an expensive few years and that there might be other departments uh, that could use that money. Um, and then just below that, you'll notice there is still the restricted revenues left over, a little bit of money from that CBT grant we had um, as well as the library technology upgrade, there's still money um, for that, which hopefully will be starting in September of next year. Um, so to help um, prepare us for the 2022 budget um, and ensure that the budget is aligned with our strategic plan, um, we created an operations plan. So the plan is, um, it's flexible, so that way we can still meet the needs um, of the community if they change. Um, as well as fit in with the community plan um, if adjustments are needed to be made. Um, so when I created the plan, I did get a hold of, I did get input from our stakeholders, um, patrons, as well as our library, um, or as well as our Riverfront Centre partners as well. Um, and I'm happy to share that with anyone. I'm obviously not going to present that today, but if someone is dying to read it, I'm happy to share it with you at another time. Um, so if you turn to the first page of my proposal, um, we are suggesting an increase of 2% um, to help overcome the cost of, um, of uh, inflation, as well as cover the 2% um, annual increase for personnel and benefits from our uh, required for our unionized um, QP staff. Um, my budget does look very similar to previous years with the exception of um, the changes to programming for strategic alignment. Does Are there any questions to this point from council members? No. Or comments? Looks good. There's no other comments, I, Samantha. I just want to um, thank you very much for a thorough budget and one that's quite easy to, to follow. And uh, I think I can speak on all behalf of council that we do recognize uh, the challenges that both the library and the museum have gone through for the last 18 months or so but um, it's very encouraging that you've been at least been able to maintain a respectable level of service uh, as a counselor i haven't personally received any complaints from the general public something that if there is major issues we usually hear them pretty quick so hats off to you and your staff uh, i don't think any of us have had any type of uh, negative reaction in terms of how we've managed uh, the COVID crisis and the, uh, and the resulting staffing shortages. So uh, on behalf of council, please extend our thank you to all of your staff, both at the library and the museum for an excellent job. And lest we not forget uh, the board members as well. So thank you to all of you. And uh, am I missing something, Michelle? Chair Santori, if I could just add for uh, the benefit of the library board, Trail Council will be continuing with their budget deliberations in the first quarter of 2022. 
Um, they have dealt with their utility funds budgets, uh, but we will be including your budget presentation within the overall operating plan when council uh, reconvenes and considers budgeting then. And you can expect to hear from us um, in the first quarter, um, probably like towards the end of March, I'd suggest, uh, Samantha, uh, with respect to finalization of the request. Thank you. A uh, question on that, Michelle, that I didn't have, but um, you've raised it now. Do they need some sort of approval from council in terms of carrying over the funds into the unexpended funds for uh, the stuff that they've ordered that have not been received yet? Because I don't want to see them in a position where that stuff comes in in January and then we don't, for whatever reason, council doesn't support the carryover of funds and end up with the shortfall. I do see that. Let me just check to see if Mr. Merlo is still here with us. Sandy, would you be able to raise Reno to a panelist? Um, I don't want to misstate, but I believe it is our common practice whereby if any purchases have been authorized in the given fiscal year, an allowance will be made for um, that to be honored in the uh, coming year. So if Reno is able just to um, add any to that, given that the library's budget, although it is managed um, uh, here by the city, it is a separate and distinct budget that the library board oversees. Okay, well, you don't have to bother Reno if that's our policy that the carryover would be honored into the next year, unless it changes, we can always discuss it by email or whatever, if it becomes an issue. I just wanted to make sure that you didn't end up with a shortfall going into January, Samantha. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions of Samantha or any of the board members? No. All right. Not hearing any. Once again, thank you and have a great Christmas and Happy New Year. Yeah. Thanks, thank everybody. you, guys. Thank you. And thank you again also for your continued yes. support for the year. It's much appreciated. Yes. You're welcome. Okay, now, where are we? I'm lost. Shared seniors coordinator position is the next item on the agenda. Oh, no, it's not, Mr. Santori. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Well, you weren't in your desk. I didn't see you there. <laughs> I said I was lost, and now I'm found. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry about that. All right. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having us. I, I love that Samantha and I get to present together, even though they're for two very different things. Um, yeah. it's, it's still really nice that we can present to you because some of the things I discussed in my report um, that you've seen um, do impact the library, obviously. Uh, so this is my cultural services report. Um, I focus mostly on third quarter here. Uh, my last visit, I think, was in August. So this is just an update uh, since then. Um, staffing has been um, has been solid with, with both Addison and I as full time. We uh, lost our summer students at the end of August, um, which was sad to see them go. They did a lot of great work for us this year. Um, in terms of Pro-D, Addison's been taking a slew of courses through the Archives Association of BC, um, which has been really helping her um, integrate herself into the world of archival um, study and practice. Um, we've also been involved in countless Zooms, as I'm sure all of you have, on any topic under the sun specific to um, Indigenous, um, Indigenous issues, race issues, reconciliation, genealogy, and museum education. Um, I've also done some uh, mandatory training through um, the city's Joint Occupational Health and Safety Committee. I sit on that committee um, as a rep for this building. Uh, so we've done some, some, some training on that front as well, which is always interesting. Uh, here's our stats. Um, you can see year to date. Uh, we've got up to the end of November here. Year to date, 43,674 through the front door. Um, there are days our door counter acts up a little bit. And same with our history gallery. We're at 1,445. We'd love to see those numbers a little higher. But again, I've just ordered a new door counter. I don't know how accurate that one is. Um, and of course, our hours open there, which, um, which you can see. Um, I didn't include last year's numbers. Last year, um, anomalies were, were to be had due to COVID. Um, and we don't even like to really look at it as a comparison. Um, so uh, you can see that we've been up to full hours 
uh, for this, the entirety of this year, which is great. We continue to um, operate per work safe and public health requirements um, pertaining to COVID. Um, of course, we're all still masking in public spaces and uh, we are going to continue our, our robust cleaning schedule and um, maintain our physical distance as we always do in public programming and staff meetings, those sorts of things. Um, the, the cleaning schedule was instituted as, as part of, you know, a work safe requirement, but we found it's, um, it's been a, a, a much needed and uh, probably healthy, healthy um, task to have to have involved here, uh, considering the numbers through our doors on a regular basis, just even for washroom use. So jumping into exhibits, I hope some of you were able to pop in and, and check out the 50 objects for 50 years. That was a partnership with the Duke of War Discovery Center who celebrated their 50th anniversary this year. Um, it was interesting. We had a we had a unique video put together by that group um, with some Duke of War music, Duke of War singing. It was lovely. And uh, immediately upon that departure, we welcomed our living languages from the Royal BC Museum. Um, and if you, I think we're on to page, page two of my report, uh, you can see I've included some photos. We had some graphics developed um, with their media kit and installed by Speed Pro, which was wonderful. It's a multi-component, really digital heavy exhibition. Um, you'll see it in our first floor gallery, the Columbia Gallery, which is our temporary one, as well as um, little interruptions throughout the history gallery. Um, I think if any of you are paying any sort of attention to what's going on in, in the heritage world, the Royal BC Museum has actually closed their, um, their old town exhibit. They are going to completely revitalize that and, and, and look towards decolonizing for a more accurate depiction of history. And you'll find in, an, in a community museum like ours, it's, there's a heavy aspect of colonial content here. Um, it's just who we are. It's how we were founded. Um, but um, injecting these kinds of um, interruptions into this really heavily white um, history that we, we naturally have here. Um, it, it speaks a lot to, um, to the progress that we're working towards here in, in the museum. So um, it's, it's basically a look at the, all the living languages and the indigenous languages in the province of BC. Um, with some really interesting samples, you can sit and listen to, to music and, and hear, hear um, how certain words are pronounced and certain sounds are pronounced. And we hear a lot of it. Um, it's like I say, it's heavily digital. So it echoes through this building and we all hear it, which is great. Um, we marked Remembrance Day as we always do in the front window. And we're working on a, the Christmas exhibit in the front exhibit space. Um, and the library's new book bike is front and center, which has solved a very big uh, storage concern, to be honest. <laughs> it's on display. <laughs> in collections, um, we're continuing our process of vetting and accepting um, donations on behalf of the Historical Society. As you know, they own the collections. Um, to date, we've accepted 503 donations on their behalf. Um, a few are going to make their way into the permanent galleries. We have a few meetings coming up with some, with some potential donors of some really interesting pieces where we'll be excited to tell you about in the new year. Uh, we met in October with a team from UBC Okanagan, their archivists, who developed and they managed the BC Digitized Regional History Online Repository. And this is the place in which we have transferred our, our digital photograph collection for public access. To, for us to pull off that kind of um, a site would be in the tens of thousands of dollars and it would be a migration probably of our database system. But this is a not-for-profit free service um, that allows for regional smaller repositories to upload um, their collections for public access. And it's really great because it connects you, every record you pull up connects you with the um, repository who owns it. So we're getting a lot of, um, we're getting a lot of outreach from researchers and we had one from CBC the other day who intend to use a photo in a New Year's Eve piece online. So it's generating a lot more um, recognition and acknowledgement of our collections. Plus it features Preston, um, Nelson, Revelstoke, the Silvery Slocan. So it's it's kind of nice to have this regional um, collection of photographs. If if you're not sure it's trail, well maybe maybe it's Creston, maybe maybe it's um, maybe it's a mine in the Slocan Valley, something like that. Um, and it's proven really really helpful. Um, so we're looking to add more content. Hopefully by the end of this year, we haven't migrated our sports collection over, but I'm sure it will probably be the most popular given given what we've what we've all gone through in this building in the last couple of weeks with with Trophy Town. Um, the collections coordinator is working really diligently on our massive West Cooney Power and Light collection. We've had it for a very long time. This was back when I was 
the sole employee with the historical society and you can never carve out time to dedicate um, a collection um, that size to actually getting it done and Addison's really plowed through um, with the help of um, our summer student Eden who, who started the arrangement process. So it's really great to see um, some of these collections finally um, being accessible. Um, as I've just mentioned, our trophy town, I hope some of you were able to see it. This is my last copy. We've had a few faulty ones, so this is literally the last one <laughs> that's available. Um, it released and it was debuted in trail on November 12th. Um, it was first developed by Bob Barrett. For those of you that don't know, he's a Toronto filmmaker and he heard about the story of the 61 smoke eaters through um, the appraiser we hired in 2018 to evaluate our collections. So it's been three years since we first made contact with Bob and we've been so thrilled with the response of the community and the recognition. <laughs> everyone involved in the success of both the 39 and 61 teams. Um, I think you all can appreciate the legacy that these teams have generated and they're fascinating people still to this day. I actually spoke with Bob this morning and he wanted me to just pass on how proud he is um, to have shared the story. Um, it will be entered into a few um, film festivals in the spring, um, which will probably generate even more um, interest. At that point, they'll probably be able to make an online link available to the film. But for now, we're kind of um, in the dark ages selling these DVDs. But I'll tell you, we sold out of the first 506 days. It was like Black Friday downstairs. <laughs> um, and I just really want to give major, major props to the front desk library staff, the CERT clerks who handled that like professionals. It was, um, it was awesome. We continue to respond to research inquiries as we do. That's one of our main functions here. Uh, we have phone, email, in-person, postal mail. Um, and I've provided your statistics there. So we had 80 uh, staff conducted research inquiries, 46 in person and um, volunteer hours of 74. These are historical society members who come in and assist us with, um, with archival work that we just can't get to. Um, I did prepare a detailed staff report pertaining to Indigenous history over um, the course of this quarter in an area for our efforts to um, understand the importance of a land acknowledgement, but also all of the responsibilities that come with making a statement like that, um, aside from just opening a meeting. So we were working with autonomous Sinaiics to develop this really lengthy report that I have soon I hope you all get to read. It'll support, hopefully will support the acknowledgement, but any land use and environmental policies that may impact decision making and, and processes. So you'll see that soon. Um, I understand that Mayor Pazin, myself, uh, Sandy Lucini and Andrea Jolly will be attending a meeting with, um, uh, led by Kathy Moore to discuss more about how the region can, can begin to, to look at a more integrated work with the autonomous Sinaiics. Um, <clears throat> we participated in the Columbia Basin Culture Tour, which was the annual two-day event that sees cultural venues and entrepreneurs open their doors to visitors. And we gave uh, the Historical Society an opportunity to set up a table to, to promote more about what they're doing, which is a little bit separate, well, entirely separate from what we do here. Um, so they were able to um, um, engage with the public and we got quite a, quite a good response. We've um, integrated a lot of our programming with the library folks and proved really, 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 really successful this year. So um, we participated in Summer Reading Club. Um, we've done some long-term care uh, facility outreach at Rosewood and Columbia View Lodge. And um, we piloted our first museum developed program with, with the um, uh, library's homeschool students. It's called All in the Family. And it was a look at how we can um, connect more with our own personal histories through, through family. And that was really successful. Uh, the COVID numbers in September saw an abrupt halt to our in-person programming, including um, a second age-friendly tea that the library put on school groups and the cancellation of subsequent visits to Rosewood for safety concerns. Obviously, I think they were the first to, to tell us that's that's enough. <laughs> but everything resumed by October. Um, museum and library resources were also pulled for um, a December Saturday series. So this month we've been doing cookie decorating and candy cane hunt and a gingerbread house contest will be this weekend. And um, they've been really popular. I don't think we expected the numbers that we've gotten. So um, I think people are really looking for things to do. We continue to support the Trail Times with the Trailblazers feature. And I speak to Sherry weekly, um, and she says it's one of their most engaging and positive features, uh, specifically for their online engagement. So I'm sure you all see it if you're online and if you get the paper, you're seeing it. 
Um, I'm really excited to say that we've also supported the creation of a historically based podcast created by a former Roslyn Trail News reporter. His name is Craig Baird. I don't know if any of you remember him. He was here in about 2006 to 2008. Um, and now he creates um, podcasts historical podcast. So this will be a historical perspective of our city and he's promised me it should arrive this week. So when I get the link, I'll send it out. Um, yeah, it should be interesting to hear. So patron management, it continues to be of top priority for us, uh, specifically for Samantha and I. Um, we experienced a troubling and targeted break-in at the end of September, which you'll all remember, and it saw the theft of the library's three 3D printers, as well as um, the week before there was a theft from our um, cash box in the print station. So while these types of events have slowed down since then, the incidents of drug use and overdoses both in our facility and immediately outside our, outside our front doors have drastically increased. Um, I can't say enough about how well staff, especially the library staff, are responding to these issues. Our largest concern at the moment, um, which you may recall from my staff report from last GOC, is the activity occurring right outside our front doors in, in our covered area. So this includes loitering and drug use, as well as the disheartening messes we routinely find. Um, we're currently assessing ways to remove some of the exterior seating for the following, um, the ability to replace the damaged damage tops and seats, which it looks like we can do, and the possibility of relocating these tables to another location permanently. Um, I had a great conversation with the Roads and Grounds Superintendent this morning. Um, we, do have a uh, we do have a location to store these for now. In my report, I did indicate this would be a seasonal um, solution, but um, it may prove really difficult to be taking those things in and out just because of the way they're secured to the concrete. So um, we're thinking a permanent removal for now and perhaps a relocation of these pieces. They're, they're nice pieces. They do, they've, they've undergone some pretty serious trauma themselves with graffiti and burn marks and those sorts of things. Um, but we can replace the tops. We're looking at other parks that could use um, more exterior seating. And perhaps in a few years when hopefully some of these issues um, have been um, remediated, we can look at um, repopulating that space for um, for exterior seating because right now they're not being used for what they're intended for. Um, but again, I want to express um, how valuable our facility staff here have been in working through these issues, cleaning up messes, assisting patrons in need, monitoring and reporting incidents with zero complaints. There have been, they have been nothing but um, cooperative and um, for, for, for things that are so disheartening, you couldn't ask for a better team of people down there. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Our gift shop continues to prove a valuable source of revenue for us. Um, we saw an increase in regional history content in the gift shop, and um, we've made tremendous sales with our vintage trail smoke eater memorabilia. So that trademarking was, was brilliant. Uh, the last two weeks have been a rush of activity due to the release of Trophy Town and um, our DVD sales. So the first order of 500 sold out in, I said eight days, I think it, maybe it was eight days. I count weekend. Yep. Another order has been placed and we hope to receive it by the end of the month. I did chat with um, with the distributor today and they're still in the process of being pressed. So pending um, deliveries, who knows, but I get phone calls every hour. Um, credit of the li uh, recognition to the library circulation staff is more than necessary here as they fielded the lines of people and in several inquiries since the film was released. Um, you'll see in my report here the cover of our uh, archival calendar, which is always really, really popular. Uh, we developed and printed all of that locally, and we received financial support from the Historical Society and Tech Trail Operations, which we do every year to fund that. And they've been swift in sales, and uh, we hope to see the remainder sold. So if you don't have one yet, pop by and pick one up. Uh, the Visitor Center. Um, so I sit on the LCCDTS's Tourism Committee, um, which collaborated together with um, other uh, tourism operators and, um, and local businesses to create a value of tourism initiative. And um, we solicited a host of prizes for a contest entitled Your Epic Day in the South Kootenai. If if you don't follow South Kootenai tourism, I encourage you to do. This um, campaign is targeted at locals, basically, and it's a call to action. Um, we want people to develop a really broad itinerary of activities in the South Kootenai, so from Roslyn to Fruitvale, including areas A and B, um, to create an epic day for a tourist, and we'll have... Um, will select the best itinerary um, and the most diverse itinerary um, and they'll receive prizes. We had over 20 donations, which is great. So I've included the website there 
And if you like, you can uh, create your epic itinerary. Um, uh, shout out here to Tourism Roslyn. They've been a massive support in developing and launching all the creative content for this initiative. So it's been a fun, it's been a fun project to be a part of, to, to, uh, to work with them collaboratively. Um, our visitor count year to date, 3,223. Um, we're cognizant of what we count as a visitor. Um, it's not just anybody who walks in the building. These are people that engage with either our tourism literature or perhaps use a washroom or a charging station, those sorts of things. And we know they're from out of town. Um, in terms of budget, um, revenue to the end of September is 24,912. I, I can assure you that, that has increased drastically <laughs> since gift shop sales have um, um, grown so much and an expenditure total of $159,731. Um, we were also really fortunate to receive our second Canadian Heritage Museum, Assistant, Museum Assistance Program grant. Um, this one was a reopening grant due to COVID. Last year's was a, um, I think it was just a support for COVID, but um, I was able to obtain 10% of my 2019 budget. So we'll see an influx of $23,000 before the end of the year, which will help offset any other costs. Um, yeah, it's been, uh, it was a, it was a welcome, welcome addition <laughs> to my inbox. And upcoming projects and priorities, um, recruitment of a temporary museum archives and visitor center manager for the coming year. Uh, we'll be looking at some more program development for our living languages to engage with the school district. Um, Addison and I are working on an emergency preparedness plan. We're in a new building um, and we've now got recent valuations on some of our collections. So we want to look at um, what are the key pieces we need to be saving um, should any of these horrible events that have happened elsewhere happen here. Uh, database record modifications. So we shifted our digital imagery to, um, a, to a city network. Uh, uh, the, IT, the IS department was kind enough to create our own space on the city network. So we've got awesome backup for our digital collections. Um, um, we thank them for that. So that'll happen. We need to update our database records now to uh, create new file paths. Um, uh, the 2022 exhibition schedule in conjunction with the exhibit committee, um, which is made up of members of the Historical Society, and then 2022 program development, that's what we'll be working on. That's a lot, but I hope <laughs> you got it all. <laughs> Thank you for a very comprehensive report, Sarah. And by the way, what do you do to keep busy? <laughs> history never takes a holiday mr santori <laughs> and i gotta admit trophy town made shopping for out of town family members a heck of a lot easier this season <laughs> no kidding uh, hey um i couldn't believe it we had we had one lady come in well i'd like to buy 36 and we have nope you you may not buy 36 <laughs> just a question that i was asked the other day was um does the, city, do you, does the city of Trail or do the museum and archives have the rights to that? Or is it the producers that own the rights to that yeah. film? The, the documentary company owns it. So we um, we provided a lot of content and we build them for that content. And the reason I asked was a couple of people from down the coast were wondering if it would be possible to to show it in, the, in a theater in Coquitlam or downtown Vancouver, because they feel there'd be so many trail people that would fill the theater, even if it was over a couple of days. But... If, uh, if you get me their name, Sandy, I can put you in touch with the producers and they can work that out themselves. That's that's just a deal that okay. they, yeah. they'd have to so make. On that, thanks, Sarah. On that note, are there any questions from council? Go ahead, Carol. Okay. Um, thanks, Councillor Santori. Sarah, I appreciated the issues that you're dealing with, with the tables and the benches in front of the center and uh, you know, thoroughly understand your reasoning for the removal. And all of that to me just speaks more to the need of a winter warming center as we had the summer cooling center. So that um, there is a facility available for homeless people to go to during the colder weather. But I would hate to see these not reinstalled into the start of the market we notice that when we've got the market going, and I attend quite a few, that the table and benches are always in full use. So I'd hate to see us lose those during the market season. What what I could suggest is that maybe maybe there is an arrangement with Parks and Rec that maybe tables and chairs are brought over for the markets. Okay. Um, you're right, that, that would be a time when they actually are used and used well. Yeah. But unfortunately that time 
that window of time is so much shorter in comparison to what we deal with daily. Yeah. Uh, and I really appreciate, I totally appreciate that. And it's just, I'm, I, we don't, those are things we don't clean on a regular basis. Um, those are things we would love to be able to have time to go out and clean on a regular basis, but they just don't form part of what we can accomplish every day. Uh, yeah. Um, but I understand what you're saying, but I don't think there's a, I, I don't think it means that there's not a solution to that problem. I think we've, we've done it for other markets where tables have come out, Silver City Days, they come out. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions of Sarah? I don't have a question, but I'd be happy to move receipt of the report. Uh, do I have a seconder? I will. Second, Bellarmine. Just on Carol's point, and maybe this isn't the time to bring it up, but it, it, is, it is truly disheartening that we have to dismantle some of our infrastructure that was part of a architectural design from the beginning as a passive area for people to take out a book, go read it on a bench on a sunny day, et cetera. And, you know, um, I'm having second thoughts about removing this. And I think we have to look at other solution and maybe work with career development services. I mean, where does this end? Are we going to start closing parts of the Trail Memorial Center because it is a public building? If it starts to get uh, damaged in certain parts of our, you know, when do we stop? I mean, there's got to be other solutions. I mean, to lose those tables during the summer months is, I don't know, just takes away so much away from that facility. And it was designed that way purposely. So, it's not for you to solve, Sarah, no. but I, I truly appreciate the fact that you brought it up as a, as a concern. And I think we need to work with career development or the RCMP. We do have, I hate to say it, but we do have loitering bylaws in this community and other bylaws that can deal with those type of issues. Go ahead, Lisa. Well, a workaround might be to um, just buy some less expensive composite kind of picnic table picnic tables that go under there and have them there instead of the more expensive, um, uh, I guess, metal, what, whatever they're made out of. And, and maybe that's a workaround so that they can be removed. I mean, the homeless situation is not going to go away. We're not going to also be able to have 24 hour security everywhere and have people move on, move on. So I don't know what the solution is, but if it's a, it's a mitigation of risk and mitigation of cost, if we look at the replacement of tables, is there a cheaper alternative so that they can be there in the summer, potentially be moved around easier and be there for the markets or just be there for the summer and then moved off? I don't know if putting wood is the best idea because if there's an issue of burning in fires, I, I don't want a fire underneath the library um, overarching area, but I think we can take this away for a discussion and realize that, or just acknowledge that none of us are really pleased with this and it's a challenging situation and just continue the discussion. And I think take the leadership from the library and uh, museum staff leadership who are there every day seeing what happens. And, and ultimately, thanks for that. Ultimately, it's, it's not about the tables. It's about and the damage to the tables it's it's the risk to staff and what we're what we're encountering um with it uh every morning um and what we're finding every morning from 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 campers to needles to bodily fluids um on a daily basis that we're cleaning up and um that to me is where my concern is coming from it's 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 and of course, the, the risk to patrons, that's our number one complaint when we've got those issues going on outside. It's the number one complaint. And um, we're not trained to handle these sorts of things. I would say our staff um, have become <laughs> pretty well versed in, in how to engage and, and speak with with. Um, with our homeless population, who we welcome in on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, and you know, it's it's something we're 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 learning to adapt. Um, we're learning to adapt to, and I think everybody in the community should be learning to adapt to it as well. Um, but ultimately, there's times we're not open, and when we are coming to the building, um, and these tables and chairs are an encouragement of nefarious activity, um, we've got safety concerns. 
that impact not just us as staff, but our patrons. Um, ultimately, I'd, I'd hope this could be a sort of a test, but in speaking with public works, the removal and reinstallation of the current set of tables and chairs will be damaging to, to the concrete. That's one thing. Um, and we do have places that these, these tables and, and chairs can go. Um, it's not like we're get rid of, getting rid of them all together. It sounds like we can actually replace replace parts that have been so far gone that that you know they're no longer really suitable for for use. Um, but if I may, I, Sarah, we're just I think maybe we should just we're we're running a bit out of town yeah. out of time, and I'm sure the council is going to be discussing this issue uh, in more detail and trying to find some other solutions. I didn't mean to cut you short there, That's but- okay. I will other... say, I will say though, uh, Public Works is slated to remove these on Thursday. So. No, no, that's fine. I think, uh, okay. you know, moving forward, we have to look at a long-term solution. If in yeah. fact uh, there is one, like I said, and Lisa reiterated, it is disheartening. And I'm sure it's keeping a lot of people away from the educational services, the archival museum services that that people could come and enjoy. And there's probably people staying away because they don't want to risk walking by there. And, and that's quite sad. So uh, if there are no other questions of Sarah, uh, thank you very much for your comprehensive report. Please extend our thanks to the staff uh, for the work that they've done over the past year. And please extend a very warm and Merry Christmas to each and every one of them. And uh, enjoy your leave, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again. Chair Santori, you did have a motion. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you. And we move on in the agenda. The next item will be the shared services coordinator position. Did you want to touch on that, Michelle? I will. Thank you, Chair Santori. Um, our Director of Parks and Recreation has provided some comprehensive reporting for your consideration with respect to the Shared Seniors Coordinator position that was supported by Council um, first in the fall of 2019 when an opportunity arose for TRAIL to participate jointly in a grant application with um, the City of Roslyn and the Village of Warfield for funding through the Columbia Basin Trust to support a shared seniors coordinator position. And with the CBT funding that was secured, the project did begin in early 2020, uh, only to then be impacted by the pandemic. Uh, there were efforts made throughout 2020 to um, reinvent some various services to be offered to the seniors. And there was an allowance made by CBT to carry forward some monies into 2021 in order that programs could be provided through the shared uh, seniors coordinator position. Uh, the primary role of the shared seniors coordinator position was to act as a conduit for seniors to, to service providers in the various communities being again, Trail, Warfield and Roslyn to help identify the needs and interests of seniors, to offer social events, basic programming and social engagement opportunities outside of what is already provided by in the various communities, and to develop and coordinate communications for seniors on matters of interest and assist with community engagement as appropriate. As we uh, moved out of COVID and, some, and into, a, I'll say a bit of an electronic age, um, the, Shared service coordinator was able to provide some activities and programs for seniors um, through Zoom events. Um, and these events were enjoyed by participants um, from Trail, Warfield and Roslyn. There are some percentages um, including in the, in the reporting. And for in-person events uh, where an activity was held in one community versus another, um, those, the, the percentage of participants would, would vary. It was felt though through this process and despite the challenges that um, were met, that it has been a, a successful um, venture and they are looking to secure funding for the shared seniors coordinator position into um, the coming year. However, the, the input from Columbia Basin Trust is no longer available. 
And with that, it will require the participating municipalities to increase their funding share. So whereas um, previously the city of Trail had committed $6,000 um, towards the project, as well as a $2,000 in-kind contribution, it is being requested that council agree to fund the shared seniors coordinator position to the tune of $16,600 for the coming year. And to again, provide $2,000 of in-kind services to support the project. Um, one addition to um, the correspondence that was received was that the Beaver Valley who had uh, separately uh, uh, had a program in place for their shared um, seniors uh, provision of service had sought some input from um, the regional partners to see if there could be a way to uh, develop a larger program or share the services out to the Beaver Valley as well. And this was addressed uh, by, the, um, by the coordinator and working with the local government um, uh, appointees who they coordinate with and it was thought because of the challenges that were experienced in the first years of the program and the fact that they don't have a well-developed program going into 2022, it would be premature to include the Beaver Valley. And so it is being recommended that the focus for their sh shared services coordinator position remain as Trail Warfield and Rosland. Um, but once it becomes better established, there could be an opportunity to revisit the Beaver Valley's request. Um, and so with that, the recommendations are included in the reporting and is being recommended that council agree to adjust the 2022 operating budget to reflect an increased contribution to the shared seniors coordinator position from $6,000 to $16,600 that council agree to continue to provide up to $2,000 of in-kind service to support the project. And that council advised the regional district of Kootenai Boundary that a larger regional approach to the shared seniors coordination position could be reviewed in a year's time once the current program has had a chance to fully commence. Thank you, Michelle. Any questions of council members? Lisa? I don't really have a question, but I just will say that I think with the closure of our Senior Citizen Center and Trail, which was, I believe, largely volunteer run last year, I think it's really important to continue our commitment to support seniors through the pandemic. It has been um, indicated that they are an increasingly vulnerable population. And I think having outreach to them and programming and a sense of support shared between the three municipalities is a great idea. Um, things have been disrupted. And so I think, you know, we have to, I feel it important to just respect the, the um, agreement that we have dealing with the capacity of trying to get our programming up and running, but look to it in the new year once things get up and running or in the next fiscal year to see if there's opportunity for larger regional collaboration. So I'm happy to move the recommendations. And again, thanks staff in Rosslyn, Warfield and Trail for all the work they're doing on the back end to uh, keep this program running and make sure our collaboration's strong. Okay, thank yes. you, Lisa. So we have a motion to proceed as recommended. Do we have a seconder? Carol? Councillor Santori, I just had a question. I just want to make sure, Michelle, this is still going to be a part-time position. It's not a full-time position, is it? It's a contracted position, so the hours of work would be included in the contractual arrangements, but it isn't a staff position. Okay, thank you. Did you second the motion as well, Carol? No, but I will. Okay. <laughs> any, any other council members have any comments or questions, concerns? Not hearing any, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried, thank you. <clears throat> Next is the contract award for the Arena Refrigeration Maintenance Services, and that's for a three-year contract for the Trail Memorial Center. Do, do we need a highlight of this or we'll leave it I can give a very brief summary. Okay, um, go, ahead. Did go to proposal call 
um, for the arena refrigeration maintenance services, um, looking at a three year time frame. Um, the proposals that were received are compared uh, within the reporting prepared by the Deputy Director of Parks and Recreation. There is a difference between uh, the costing for the routine inspections, as well as the major overhauls that are being uh, required in the coming years. However, when considering um, both of those costs in conjunction, Yeti re refrigeration is the low bidder and is deemed to be uh, capable of performing the scope of work and the services required and with that, it is being recommended that the city enter into a three-year contract with Yeti Refrigeration for the base price of $6,434 per year for annual inspections, plus all applicable taxes, fees, and charges related to arena refrigeration maintenance services at the Trail Memorial Center. So move. Move by Second that. Seconded by Lisa. Any questions? Go ahead, Carol. Okay, I'll just be quick with this. Um, I noticed that one of the pluses that we got from Yeti was the cost of, I guess, feeding and transportation for their staff or their workers was considerably lower. Where is Yeti located? Do you know, Michelle? I don't know. I'm not familiar with um, the locations of any of the three proponents. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, it was moved by Eleanor, seconded by Lisa. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. Next item on the agenda is the Community Safety Task Force, and that's for a $10,000 budget. I believe last, year's, uh, last year was the first time that the task force was given an allocation of $10,000, and they're asking, um, and the request is for the same this year. Is there anything else that you wanted to add to that, Michelle? So I think it just provides some clarity that um, with this budget allocation, um, the task force is recommending that it be awarded to the trail cat, the community action team <coughs> to be used towards their respect and connect campaign. Some grant funding had been received by the city and um, council um, may recall that uh, a voice over project was uh, recently released by the Trail Community Task Force. Um, and with that, there's the, the actions that are now being taken by the Trail Community Action Team to promote uh, a greater tolerance and to destigmatize de uh, uh, both mental health issues and drug abuse um, concerns, it's very important work and, and ongoing. And so the task force is recommending that the budget allocated towards the task force efforts um, be diverted and utilized for this important purpose. Go ahead, Colleen. I, I would like to move the recommendation that uh, council support this allocation to the community task force. Okay, thank you. Do we have a seconder? Paul Butler. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion is carried. Lisa, just a question. The 10,000 allocation last year, I don't recall. Was council, do we know specifically where that 10,000, it was on a... It wasn't used. This was the first year that when we looked at the task force to have it, uh, to put an actual budget towards it. And uh, it hadn't been used until now. Okay. Thank you. Did I uh, call for the vote? Yes, I did. Okay, next on the agenda, RDKB planning agreement renewal. Um, thank you, Chair Santori. Um, this is an agreement that the city and the RDKB have um, entered into previously, um, but the agreement is coming to a conclusion on December 31st, 2021, and the regional district has reached out to see if the city is interested in um, participating in it again. Um, the gist of the, uh, of the agreement is that it allows the city's regional director to participate in electoral area services meetings and be 
provided an opportunity to vote at the electoral area services and board meetings on planning related decisions, such as OCP or zoning amendment applications or development and development variance permit applications in the fringe areas of electoral areas A and B that are closely located to the city's boundaries. Uh, the cost of the city's participation um, is based on a flat fee plus a per square kilometer um, requisition rate. Um, it is uh, just over $2,000 annually. There is a very small increase anticipated for um, the coming five year term. So if council is agreeable to the renewal, we would be looking at an, uh, an annual fee of $2,109 annually. Um, and it is being recommended that council agree with this renewal and authorize the mayor and corporate administrator to execute the agreement given the benefits of the city's participation in these um, planning related decisions in the electoral areas that it's derived. I'll move Thank the you. recommendation. Moved by Lisa, seconded by Second. Colleen. Any questions? No. Go ahead, Carol. Thanks, uh, Councillor Santori. Um, Michelle, could I just refer to, it's our page 83, it's their page two of three where they held the calculation table. In the third paragraph down where they kind of did the outline of how they calculate these costs, um, the last sentence in there says that the re requisition to Fruitvale was 1166 per year for the 2011 to 26 agreement, but down on the table it shows as 1187. Was that a typing mistake or a calculation mistake or... I, I, don't have the, I wouldn't have the specifics for fruit veils um, costing. There was a, a very nominal difference, though, in what was reflected for trails requisition based on our agreement. So um, I think it is really just uh, perhaps a rounding error or a, a rounding um, methodology when it came to drafting the agreement. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a mover and a seconder, moved by Lisa, seconded by Colleen. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Uh, the motion is carried. No further items on the agenda. Call for adjournment and reconvene with regular with the public hearing at six o'clock.